Hello and good morning and welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. I'll leave it a wee second before I get started on uh, this week's talk. So welcome to uh, this week's Learn with Lorna. Hello, it's nice to see your hellos coming in. There was a big delay there, so I didn't see you saying hello, so I'm glad that you're out there. Uh, my name uh, is Lorna, as many of you will know, I am the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. Uh, my role involves sharing the collections that we look after across our four archive centres in the Highlands to audiences of, of all descriptions. Just yesterday I was working with uh, some school teachers, today I'm here speaking to you. Um, this series, as you will know if you've watched before, is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in, uh, in the Learn with Lorna films. If you are able to donate towards our work then we really appreciate that. There's a link to be able to do so whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube and thank you so much for those of you who've done it. It really does make a difference to our, um, to our work and to what we're able to do with our collections. This week is the final in uh, our transport and travel themed talks and we're looking at the fantastic Bailey of Denain collection. This is a, a large and wide ranging collection held at the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness. It includes many references to travel and transport. There are letters to and from and references to, and bear with me while I read this out because it's quite extraordinary, um, letters relating to India, Iraq, the Persian Gulf, France, Holland, Germany, America, Portugal, Crimea, South Africa, Demerara, Isle of Nevis and other places in the Caribbean. So a really, um, both a very strongly locally rooted collection and also a collection with a lot of information from across the world in it. I could do numerous talks on this collection and I may well come back to it. Um, but this week I wanted to give you just an overview of, of the family papers within the collection and tell the stories of two particular members of the Bailey family for whom traveling to another country had huge, huge repercussions. For both of them, it was uh, something which was a, f a formative event for them. So first of all, an overview of this collection. Bailey of Denain uh, is our deposited collection number 456. It's extensive. There are over 4,000 letters in it and other documents. And it's split into dozens and dozens of bundles of letters and it's one of the exciting collections to go into and open the box and just wonder what you're going to come across in there because there's just so much in there. Um, the collection dates from 1720 to 1869 and that um, ending date of 1869 is relevant as we'll see as we come on and it's split into eight sections A to K but the vast majority of the collection is within sections A to C. So D456 slash A are the papers relating to the Bailey of Denain, the Baileys of Denain themselves and their friends and relatives. D456 slash B are papers relating to the Inverness Fencibles Regiment of which um, Colonel John Bailey was, he was a, a central to raising that regiment. And then D456 slash C are papers relating to the Macdonalds of Glengarry. So three quite distinct strands within the collection and it's thought that the reason that those three very different themes were brought together in one collection was through the famous Highland solicitor, politician uh, and historian Charles Fraser Mackintosh. He was factor for the Denain estate from 1865, so um, in charge of looking after the estate and also possibly for the Macdonnells. And certainly the outside of many of the documents are annotated with his handwriting. The collection was found in a trunk in Inverness Castle and the Bailey, of, uh, the Bailey family arranged for it to be catalogued by Sandra Bardwell who uh, was an archivist and is, have volunteered with us for around 20 years um, working on collections such as this. So who are the Baileys? Where is Denain for those of you who are not familiar with this part of the world? The Baileys are an important local family. They have various notable branches including the Baileys of Denain, of Dochfour and of Lays, um, all of which are estates around Inverness. All, across all branches of this family there are huge connections to travel and to in, international trade. Denain Estate sits about three miles to the southwest of Inverness and it came into the family in the 1400s. Now as I mentioned section A in particular relates 
to uh, the Bailey family themselves, their relatives, friends and other social connections, the people that they corresponded with. So what sort of things can be found in section A? All sorts. What is not in there? It's one of those collections like Fraser Teitler, like Margaret MacDougall that I've talked about before, where you know you're going to find probably a reference to whatever you're looking for. It's a marvellous collection. Okay, so there are documents that give insights into trade and industry and business. For instance, there's an illuminated document from 1705, which shows um, Sir Archibald Campbell of Clunes being admitted as a burgess to the city of Glasgow. George Buchanan Bailey was one of the witnesses and Archibald would go on to marry into the Baileys. An illuminated manuscript, if you're not familiar with the term, simply means that it is a document that has um, a coloured section to it. So uh, an illustrated de uh, or decorative uh, element to it that's been coloured, often associated with documents found in monasteries. In this case, it's the elements from the crest of the city of Glasgow, or the coat of arms of the city of Glasgow, that are illustrated. So the bird that never flew, the tree that never grew, the bell that never rang, and the fish that never swam are all illustrated on the front of this. Those things are all connected to the life of St Mungo, the patron saint of Glasgow. And it just goes to show that there can be information in collections relating to places um, distant, far away, nearby. You need to look in lots of different places to find uh, references to things. There are also documents relating to much more local trades and businesses. So there are bills and letters from the 1700s and 1800s that refer to the purchases of claret, of cloth, of medicine, shoes, suits of clothes, muslin, flannel, haircuts, uh, education expenses, just all sorts of things. There are numerous letters in here as well, which essentially are full of gossip. <laughs> this is one of the reasons we love this collection. Uh, information about local news, rumours about people's relationships, uh, who is getting together with who, all sorts of things. And a large number of these are by Isabella, Isabella Bailey and her daughter Anne. Now Isabella, Bailey as, uh, Isabella Campbell, as she was, married John Bailey in the 1780s and they would go on to have at least five children. Alec, Archibald, Catherine, Anne and William. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of those shortly. John Isabella's husband died in Ireland in 1797. He was serving in the military and had spent time in India and he's buried in uh, Kilkenny Cathedral. Isabella then was left a widow after only 10 years of marriage and with these five children. And the military connection had been strong so I mentioned that John served in the military but it was strong across all the strands of the Bailey family. Um, so as well as John serving so too did his brother William, Isabella's brother-in-law. And I wanted to tell you, first of all, William's story. It's particularly interesting and one of those ones, as I mentioned, that has travel and going to another place as the formative event of his entire life. So William Bailey of Denain was born in 1739. He was the grandson of that Sir Archibald Campbell that I mentioned in that Glasgow document. He was the oldest child. He had his brother John, who I've mentioned, and also two sisters. Along with John, he was educated at King's College in Aberdeen and then went on to Edinburgh University. In October 1759, age 20, he was appointed an ensign in the 89th Regiment of Foot, which was a regiment that was still in the process of being uh, created by the Dowager Duchess of Gordon. Within a very short time of that regiment being created, uh, they, it was so successful that they were dispatched to India. And William embarked at Portsmouth on the Admiral Watson in his uh, early 20s. He arrived in India in time to take part in the siege and the ca uh, capitulation of Pondicherry and before, before he then went on to transfer uh, to the Madras army of the Honourable East India Company. A name, uh, a, uh, Honourable East India Company, is something we come across a huge, huge amount at this period. William served in numerous battles and campaigns in the 1760s and 1770s against the French who were fighting in support of Hadir Ali and um, his son Tipu Sultan. Tipu Sultan also known as the Tiger of Mysore. Tipu Sultan was a famous military leader, he was a very innovative uh, military leader and he ruled the southern Indian kingdom of Mysore and the British and in particular the East India Company saw him as a threat to the expansion of uh, the British in India. And there were three wars fought between the two sides from 1767 to 
through to 1792. I mentioned that William fought in numerous of these, uh, many of these battles, and he built a distinguished military career in his time in India until 1780, the Battle of Polilur. This was part of the Second Anglo-Mysore War. And at this battle, William was by now uh, a colonel, and he was leading a brigade column against the Mysore army. The battle was for various reasons, a complete and utter disaster for the British. It was one of the worst, if not the worst, uh, disaster that the British ever faced uh, in the on the North and the Indian subcontinent. A huge, huge disaster. William had been leading three three thousand eight hundred and fifty three men, three thousand eight hundred and fifty three, and of those, over three thousand five hundred were killed. Now, much of the responsibility through history for this failure has been laid at William of, uh, William Bailey's door, although there have been recent studies that have suggested that maybe Sir Hector Munro of Navarre, who was encamped with the main army nearby but didn't mobilise them to come to Bailey's support, uh, should also carry a substantial responsibility for the failure of this battle. Interesting because we also hold the Munro of Navarre records, so we're able to look at, at those uh, two sides of the argument. William Bailey was taken prisoner uh, as a result of this failure of this battle. Uh, he was also forced to see the heads of his fellow officers displayed in front of him. Um, and he was taken prisoner and he was held in a dungeon in Seringatapam. He was secured in irons and denied any medical assistance until he died there in November 1782. And I find it really interesting. It's a, it's a, a powerful story for, for lots of different reasons. And our historic association with India is a, a, an interesting period and a difficult period, I think. Um, but I find it interesting because I so much associate the Baileys with Inverness, with uh, being around this area. But he had left, he grew up here, but he had left Inverness to go, first of all, to school in Aberdeen, then to Edinburgh University, then to Portsmouth, and then for the rest of his life in India. So actually his uh, his own connection with the Highlands was very, very short, um, but really in that, it, it was in that rooting of his family being here for such a long time. So that 20 year old who boarded the ship in Portsmouth uh, never returned home, but he still exists in the letters of his that we hold. William's death was followed 15 years later by that of his brother, John, as I mentioned, also in service in uh, working at that time in um, Ireland. So John therefore left his widow Isabella, who I mentioned uh, a little minute ago, and who we're going to go back and look at now. Now Isabella appears to have been, by all accounts, an absolutely formidable woman. Um, and her strength of personality really comes across in her letters, of which there are many. She is an absolutely fascinating character, I think. Uh, as is her daughter Anne, who I'll talk about in a second. Um, so there are letters of Isabella Bailey complaining basically about most things. Um, complaining about her estate manager. There are letters where she complains to her relatives that they're not communicating enough or they're not communicating properly. Um, there are letters describing the lack of cleanliness that she sees in the poorer classes and the fact that cholera is spreading amongst them because of this. Um, her role as the matriarch and the only remaining parent is very, very evident, it's very visible in her letters, as is the influence that she exerted over her children's lives. Um, I think of her maybe a little bit cruelly, as a little bit like Mrs Boynton out of Agatha Christie's Appointment with Death, that kind of very dominant matriarchal figure. Um, there are letters to her son Archie in which she instructs him to apply himself better at college and to stop trifling with his time. Uh, a place at college that she had arranged and organised and sent him to. Um, an 1808 letter by Isabella to Charles Grant MP reveals Isabella's plans for Archie. She intends that he will go on to take up a civil appointment in India and she tries to put this all in place for him. A later letter to Grant again asks him for his assistance with her son's affairs because she says he is destitute of all aid and you must step in and help my son. But all of Isabella's kind of manoeuvring for, for Archie for his future was in vain because within a few years of these letters being written he had died and this meant that by now Isabella had lost her brother-in-law William, her husband John, her son Alec who had died about 1808, 
her son Archie who died in 1817 and she was to go on by 1819 to have also lost her daughter Catherine. Catherine who had married into the Roses of Kilrock who you may remember me talking about in previous episodes. So Isabella was now left with her daughter Anne and her son William who on Archie's death became heir to the Dunane estate. Now I mentioned Isabella being a big character and a, a very dominant uh, and formidable woman. Now, I think Anne was absolutely the same. Um, Anne often got on the wrong side of her mother and often got the rough side of her tongue. And we can see that in the letters. They both seem to be incredibly forceful, incredibly strong willed. And there are some really unusual letters between the two of them. And to my mind, and I'd be interested to see if you agree with this, to my mind, they feel really, really modern. So, an 1821 letter by Isabella accuses Anne of being unwilling to speak to her and criticises her daughter's behaviour, her plans for the future and basically everything about her personality. Um, and there are lots of other letters, there are various letters across a wide time range that show that same uh, awkward, difficult mother-daughter relationship. Um, there are accusations, there are complaints Anne, the daughter, went away, spent some time living away from the Highlands and apart, in par apparently the part of the reason that Anne went and lived elsewhere was she was told that she had to have the Highland rust rubbed off her to make her suitable for society. Um, so obviously being too Highland was holding her back. When she expressed a desire to return to Deneen, her mother uh, made it very clear that she would prohibit the move that she didn't want her to come back. The collection also includes a letter from Isabella to a friend complaining that her daughter had been sending her abusive letters in response to her suggestions for her daughter's life. And listen to this extract from a letter uh, by Isabella to Anne. It's just, like I say, I, I think it sounds very modern. So this is her writing to her daughter. Well, when a young woman tells a parent that she can't bear to be spoken to, there's nothing for but to, to digest it. You say you meant not to be contradicted, or to use a harsher term, you meant not to be repulsed. Be it so, you say you are willing to talk to me before a third person. I am most willing to give my sentiments candidly, and I will be happy to correct it if I am wrong. We are all subject to error, and I think it's a presumption in anyone, and very unlike the humility of a Christian, to set up their own opinion as infallible. You have hitherto been nursed in the lap of indulgence, and you know very little of the ways of this world. It's, um, to me, like I say, it just sounds very modern. It's very just, uh, you're not too big to go over my knee. Just how dare you disagree with me and set yourself up as, as uh, bigger than me. Now, the reason that Anne was hoping to come back to Deneen and spend time there, and one of the reasons for that difficult relationship with Isabella, was Anne's, and this is a direct quote, Anne's obsessive concern for her brother William. There are many, many letters in this collection about William, and I'm going to tell you his story next. Now, I mentioned that both William's father, John, and his uncle, William, uh, who we've looked at already, had been career soldiers and officers in the East India Company. Now, William grew up with this knowledge of that long family connection to both the military and to, to India and the East India Company. So he grew up with that knowing that that was a family tradition and he vowed that he too would go to India as soon as he was able to do so, which he did arriving in September um, 1811. Good, I'm glad to see other people saying, <laughs> laying it down straight. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful mother-daughter letters, aren't they? Um, so William went to, uh, to India in 1811 and we hold letters written to his mother uh, detailing his journey, his fellow passengers, uh, there were 14 ships in the fleet that took him and also his letters of introduction uh, when he was going to get to India who would he be introduced to and how would he uh, the letters would serve as an introduction for him to those people. William's aim uh, was slightly different from that of his father and uncle his aim was to study languages and on arriving in India he decided very quickly to follow advice and travel on from India to Baghdad to study Persian and Arabic languages with a view to remaining there long term as part of the East India Company for who, as you can imagine with their geographical reach, language skills were a huge, huge benefit for anyone who, who had that skill. 
and so that was William's aim to to spend time in India and then beyond and beyond uh, to go to Baghdad, study Persian and Arabic languages, and stay there working in a diplomatic role and a political role, something like that. Now William had only been in the Persian Gulf for a short period of time, about two years, when a letter from James Calder came back and noted a serious change in William's behaviour. He noted that our poor friend, he says, was suffering from a disordered mind. And this is uh, an extract from a book, which I'll tell you more about the book at the end, but this is an extract about it. In October 1813, Calder penned a note, presumably to his agent in London, that William had suffered extreme mental disorder, which necessitated sending him home as soon as possible. Your friend William Bailey is now in the most deplorable of all situations, suffering under a disordered mind. He must go home by the first opportunity. He has been with me mostly ever since the appearance of this disorder and has since become greatly deranged indeed. It has been a source of much distress to me. I have yet written to no one in Europe on this subject, so keep it to yourself for the present. Yet in his flustered state, Calder did not mail the notification straight away. And there is an addendum dated 22nd of December in informing the recipient that the letter would be delivered by one MacLeod of the Mills, to whose kind care I have committed our poor friend William Bailey, of whose deplorable fate you will probably be apprised before this reaches you. Calder wrote that William leaves Bombay in a state of total mental derangement, but may, I trust, regain health of mind to a considerable degree at least during the voyage. I am a loss, at a loss to whom to write or to whom to consign him in London except yourself and I'm sure that you will gladly take charge of him and provide for him in his helpless and pitiable, pitiable condition. He talks of a Mr Aves as his chief friend in London. I am writing particularly about his case to Sir James Mackintosh who is interested in him. There is a European servant named Morgan Richard now attached to his person who will attend him for as long as you wish. So uh, Calder there sending William home and sending him home in the care of somebody who will look after him. A later letter by Calder goes on to describe William as having a dreadful malady which needs much delicacy. And there have been, there were at the time and there have been since, all kinds of speculation about um, what was the root of this? What is it? Is it a mental illness? There, it was said frequently at the time that it was sunstroke, it was brought about by being in a hot country. Was that a euphemism for covering something? Was that what they believed? We're, we're not sure. Um, so there's references to sunstroke, there's references to it being lunacy, to it being brain fever, um, and to a variety of other things. One letter talks about a rumour that he'd done something while he was there, and that was why he had to be got out of the country. But then they go on to say there's no other evidence for that. One letter suggested that he was de uh, deranged on arrival in Bombay. Whatever the cause of it, William arrived back in 1814, having only been away for three years. And letters to his mother at this time really indicate that distressed state of mind. So he writes to her that he's being poisoned and he needs her help. He says that he's being held in London against his wishes. He doesn't like the servant who's looking after him. And one that I find really sad, he says, I want to come home and not die among strangers. I want to come home to you. Now, his mother, Isabella, who, as, as you will uh, have gathered from what I've said so far, brought the weight of her personality to bear and wrote to the East India Company pleading for assistance for William. And this is uh, the letter that she wrote. I beg humbly to address your honourable court on behalf of my son, Mr William Bailey, writer of the Honourable Company's Bombay establishment, who, having discovered a predilection for the Honourable Company's service, was highly and very expensively educated accordingly, and he proceeded to India as a writer in the year 1811. This predilection was owing to his father, the late Colonel John Bailey, having so long served in India, and more particularly his uncle, Colonel William Bailey, whose life was sacrificed to the service of the Honourable Company, and whose services and sufferings must be well known to many of the Honourable Directors. The premature death of both of these gentlemen has proved to the family a loss irreparable, and has left the paternal estate exceedingly embarrassed. It becomes now my painful duty to state that although my son left this country for India with a bodily and mental constitution equal to that of any of his relatives who have had the honour of holding such distinguished situations, both civil and military, 
within your company's service. He returned to this country in 1814 in a deplorable state of mental health, amounting, I fear, to absolute mental derangement. The particulars of which will be more fully submitted to your honourable court by Dr Rees of London, under whose charge he now remains. For some time after my son's arrival in India, I had the most flattering accounts of his indefatigable application to his duties, which was confirmed by his being appointed to a situation at Baghdad, eventually most promising. And for, for every information I have been able to obtain, it was in the zealous discharge of his duties at this station during an unusually hot season that he was attacked for the first time with his present mal malady. By a letter I had from him dated 10th of January, 1813, he appears to have recovered so far as to have received the highly respectable appointment of Acting Collector General of Bombay, but he was finally obliged to, to be embarked by his friends in the deplorable state in which he now unfortunately continues. So she writes uh, a summary of what's happened to him and she finishes her letter by saying, um, I take the liberty of submitting to your honourable court that my unfortunate son, having in the discharge of his duties in India been, rent been rendered incapable of further service, either for the honourable company or even for himself, he now has no resource. But in the consideration which his own services and sufferings, as well as the service and sufferings of his uncle, the late Colonel William Bailey, and other relatives, because of those sufferings that both William has suffered and his father and his uncle, she said, please, would you be in a position to give him £300 a year, a provision so that he can survive, uh, so that he can support himself to some extent. Now, there are dozens of letters, many dozens of letters relating to William in this collection about his state of health and about his care. Now, that letter mentioned Dr Rees, who he was in ca the care of, and he spent time with Dr Rees in Hackney, who did various examinations and concluded that William was a lunatic, incapable of looking after his own affairs. His business card uh, has the word lunacy in big bold letters at the top of it. It's quite, um, gives you a bit of a shock when you look at it. So he came from London. Uh, he then went on to spend time in care in Edinburgh. And yes, I'm seeing Fiona, your comment, that was a lot of money to ask for. Absolutely it was, and she wasn't successful in quite that amount, but he was given a quarterly gratuity of £30. Um, so he spent some time in London in care, he then spent some time in Edinburgh and as I mentioned earlier on the death of his brother uh, Archie in 1817, William then became the Laird of Dunane in name although really not uh, in practice. In 1826 he returned to Dunane and in 1830 his sister Anne took over management of his affairs just prior to their mother's death and her that passionate love and attachment and concern for him that was mentioned before continued uh, and you can see that in the letters that she tries to find ways to give him um, brain stimulus she tries to find ways to in a modern phrase to let him live his best life um, she tries to find ways to make him feel that he is the laird even though there's a lot that he is not able to do and it's really interesting that Anne was given that care because that, that role of caring for him, because previously, according to a variety of letters, Anne seeing William had caused him upset, which was why Isabella didn't want her to come home. She was keeping them apart. Now, William's letters at this time are particularly interesting. There's just a handful of them, uh, six, I think, um, that are written phonetically. I was going to try and read one out to you, but it will it will sound normal because it's phonetical. Um, so what I'm what I'll do is I'll I'll um, take an image of one, upload it onto Facebook after I finish talking, so that you can have a look at it. Ret letters written phonetically. We don't know why there have been linguistic papers written about this. Academics have looked at, at William's language to see. Is this something representative of insanity? Does this go back to the fact that he had studied language? And there's a letter that he wrote to his brother Archie talking about understanding the roots of languages, how languages are built and created, the similarities between the two, um, kind of distilling down to what is the essential part of a language, that communicative ability. So does this, 
do these phonetic letters represent a mental imbalance or do they represent uh, a skill and an ability with language that he was still exploring? Don't know. Anne went on to die in the early 1860s and William himself died in 1869, the last of the Bailey of Denain line. And that was why I mentioned at the beginning that that date of the collection ending in 1869 is key. His obituary in the Inverness Advertiser gave a summary of the family's place in Highland history, some of the big deeds that had been accomplished by various members of the family, including William and John. And it gives some information about young William himself. And it concludes that for nearly 60 years, as everyone knows, he had been lost to society. And my colleague Fiona will uh, testify that's one of one of the things that struck her most as an emotive and powerful sentence just to say of somebody for 60 years he had been lost to society um, and he was the last of the line so with him being lost so too was the Bailey of Denain line. If you're interested in finding out more about the Baileys and they are an absolutely fascinating family and one of the things I was thinking as I was writing this was an extraordinary family of characters and personalities and um, dominant strong women and you know men who have gone and and died chained in a cell I mean there, there are such extraordinary stories within this collection uh, I came across one yesterday as I was looking of a, a family member or associate of the family going to support Florence Nightingale in Crimea um, there's just all sorts in here. So if you're interested in finding out more about them, you can uh, search for William Bailey of Denain, uh, the younger William, and you'll find that academic paper that I mentioned talking about his phonetic letters and his vowel structures and, and so on. Um, but there are also these two books which I have been reading extracts out of because they're written based on our collections. So there's this one here, Call of Empire from the Highlands to Hindustan, which is written by Alexander Charles Bailey, so a descendant not of the direct of the Bailey line, but of the Bailey family. Um, and that tells the story of various members, but particularly William of Denain, the one who died in India, and also of John Bailey of Lees. And then this one here, written by Alan Tritton, uh, When the Tiger Fought the Thistle. And again, this is about William Bailey and uh, his fight with Tipu Sultan, the Tiger of Mysore. They're fascinating, so if you're interested in finding out more about this family, then I would really recommend those two books to you. Um, thank you for joining me to find out a little bit more about the Baileys. Uh, I hope you can join me next week. Next week I'll be looking at stories of migration, some of the letters in our collections that talk about people's experiences of leaving home, of experiencing a new land uh, and a new, a new world and a new way of life. So I hope you can join me next week for that one and uh, a reminder that this series will is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered uh, in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events but if you're able to donate towards our work then we're very grateful for that.